Everyone, it is so great to be with you. I hate that I'm not in person with you. And the reason is because I love your leaders so much. Uh, Pastor Phil and Brenda, I have just grown to love you uh, from afar and have longed to be with you guys, but haven't had that opportunity to be in person with you guys. But I wanna thank you for your invitation for me to speak into the lives of your students. What you guys have in this couple is absolute gold. And I want to honour them today for all the work and all the sowing that they have sown into your lives. And so I just want you to know we love you. Uh, We send our greetings from Nashville, Tennessee at The Belonging. And I'm so looking forward to speaking this word with you today. So let's get started. So Father, I just thank you. I thank you for the season that we're living in. And though we may not understand everything that's going on, we know that you are in control. God, I thank You that Your Word, Your Word is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It has the ability to divide between soul, spirit, joint and marrow and it judges the attitudes of our heart. So God, I pray that this Word, anointed by Holy Spirit, would go deep into the hearts of these students and that their lives would be changed and You would empower them and equip them to live as You would have them live, completely uh, in the knowledge that You are in control and that everything's gonna be okay. So Father, anoint this Word. In Jesus' Name we pray, Amen. Well, I really felt, uh, I, I was toying between a couple of words to speak to you, but I think that right now we're living in a climate where um the fear of the future or the fear of the unknown or just anxiety is at an all time high. I think especially for you guys as students that you are sowing into your future, yet the future looks really unstable. Even just, you know, whether you're gonna be in person or online or what's the world gonna look like? Has the world changed forever since this pandemic was unleashed on our world in 2020? What does my future look like? Is it even... Uh, a thing that I need to bother with the study or what am I supposed to do for this future? And I felt God just really bring this particular message to mind to help you understand that God is on the throne, God is in control and that we don't have to fear, we don't have to worry and we don't have to live with anxiety. Uh, I find right now that this generation is riddled with anxiety and we feel almost ashamed that we are riddled with anxiety. We don't know what to do with our anxiety. And I want to just open this up today to um, that Scripture in Psalm 46, 10 and it just finishes off this particular chapter and it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So how do you learn to be still and know that He is God, knowing that He has got everything in control when your world feels completely out of control. How do you be still? Is it me, does it mean to be still and do nothing? Does it mean be still and watch the world pass over? Is it be still and freak out? But, but here it's saying, be still and know that I am God. That phrase, be still, that word is used here. It's the Hebrew word Rapha actually. And it means to properly cast down. It means to let fall. It means to be relaxed. It means to slacken. It means, especially in the hands, letting go of what's in your hands. To not make the effort basically means leave the matter to God. And I wanna give you five simple keys via an acronym to help you that whatever situation you find yourself in in 2021, you're gonna remember this message, you're gonna remember this acronym and you're gonna be able to apply whatever uh, is at the place that you're at, that you're gonna be able to use these keys 
to fight and overcome anxiety. And this is gonna teach you how to be still and know that He is God. I'm gonna read a couple of Scriptures that you may be familiar with. First is Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer, petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. First Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on Him for He cares for you. Be self-controlled, be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So resist him, standing firm in the faith. And Psalm 94 verse 19 says, When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. So I need you to know first and foremost, just take the shame whether you're feeling anxious right now. Take that off right now because here the Bible speaks quite a great deal about anxiety. It's not that we're not ever going to have anxious moments. It's when we allow anxiety to actually overcome us and take us over. So If you are feeling anxious, the Bible speaks about this, that there are people that were feeling anxious. David was anxious. Uh, The disciples were anxious when Jesus was taken to the cross. What's gonna happen now? What does our world look like now? Job was anxious when things were going against him. There were things in life that people developed anxiety in. And so the Lord knows this. But He gives us the keys of how to live above anxiety, what to do with our anxiety, what to do with what concerns us. He says, I've got the key. I've got the issue at hand. I just need you to apply what I am saying so that you can allow anxiety to not have you. And I want to uh, basically put, I love that be still, that word in the Hebrew means to cast down. There's that Scripture that actually says, cast your cares on the Lord. What does cast mean? It actually means throw it with all your might as far away from you as possible. When you cast a net, you're throwing it so far into the deep. When you cast a fishing line, you're throwing it so far out into the depths of the ocean that you cannot reach it. When you throw a shot put in the Olympics, you are casting that so far, far away. You're casting something that goes way, way away. So this is the picture that God is talking about. And He says, cast your cares. Cast that which concerns you. I need you to throw it to me. I need you to give it to me. What we are doing is we are carrying our cares and we are letting our cares burden us. We are thinking and thinking and indwelling these thoughts instead of throwing them to the one who can do something about it. So when we are being still, And knowing that He is God, we're not just being still in our thoughts and allowing those thoughts to overrun us. We're being still by casting down vain imaginations, hypotheses, uh, worst case scenarios, fear, all those things that get us into a pit of despair. We are casting that down. We are letting that fall. We are throwing it into the hands of Jesus. And so this is just a simple acronym of the word cares because He cares for what concerns you. God cares. He cares about the small details. Some of you right now think God doesn't care about the small things in your life. He doesn't care. You think He doesn't care about the grades or the family situation that's going on or or what's going on in your heart. I can tell you right now, He cares for you so much. His thoughts about you are so vast 
they're a lot more vast than the grains of sand on the shore. The Bible says that He thinks so highly of you and His thoughts are that many uh, for you individually. Think about that. The God of this universe has all of those thoughts for every single human being on this planet. He cares. And so I want to break down this word cares into five points And so if you've got your pen and paper, I want you to write these five uh, letters down and I'm going to unpack them and we're going to pray at the end of this. You ready? Okay. The first one is to cry out. Uh, Someone very wise once said to me um, in her lifetime that she learnt how to cry a river. It's okay to cry, Alex. See, I came up in a youth group and a ministry that didn't allow you to grieve and mourn because that represented a lack of faith. Um, so you were had to just, you know, praise God, hallelujah, everything's okay. Oh no, God's on the throne. We're all good. Hallelujah, praise God. Yep, feeling good, feeling good. Yet inside, my whole world is falling apart. But oh, I cannot show that because that shows a lack of faith. And this wise lady who went through one of the most tragic things in her life where her son, who was very, very ill, uh, doctors misdiagnosed the illness. He had meningitis. They thought it was just a flu and a cold and sent him home. He ends up dying and they resuscitate him back to life. But what happens, it causes brain damage. And this boy that was very sick, misdiagnosed, now has to live with brain damage for the rest of his life. And she said, I cried a river. I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. And I think so much sometimes why we feel such angst and anxiety is because we don't allow ourselves to cry. There are men in the room that are listening to this right now and you've been taught to, come on, son, get over it. Be strong. You don't need to cry. Crying is for wimps. And we've suppressed our emotions to want to cry out and therefore wonder why anxiety is literally brewing on the inside and bubbling up like a volcano. Jesus wept. And if Jesus wept when He was perfect, when He was the Son of God, He wept because He knew what it meant to grieve and mourn with those that mourn. Rejoice with those that rejoice. There was empathy. He wept when Lazarus died, even though he knew he was going to rise him from the dead, but he wept with those that were weeping. He wept at the state of humanity, realising that they were hopeless, knowing that the one of all hope is right in front of them and they can't even see it. He wept. He wept over a city when He looked and had compassion over a generation and said, look at them, they're harassed. They're like sheep without a shepherd. He wept over the city. Jesus wept. If Jesus wept, then we should know how to weep. David wept. David cried out when Saul was against him. David wept when his son was killed. David wept when he lost his son. David wept when he sinned. Hannah wept when she needed a miracle. Job wept when his children were taken from him, his livelihood stolen and his body was riddled with boils. We need to weep. There's a time to cry. There's a time to rejoice and there's a time to mourn. And if you don't allow that expression to come out, what happens is when you suppress the emotion, anxiety builds up in its place. Why I know that we are allowed to cry is in Psalm 56 verse 8, it says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all of my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. Think about that for a minute. God Almighty collects our tears and pops them in a bottle and He records our sorrows. He knows what concerns us and He wants to be the healer. He wants to be Jehovah Rapha, the healer to make us whole. 
He wants us to understand that we can be still while He is at work, but it's actually okay to cry out. And so the first thing you need to do is learn to cry out to a God and express and lament those things that are burdening you. It's okay to get into your secret place and cry out to the Lord and say, God, I don't understand why this is happening. He can handle your fear. He can handle your doubt. He can handle your angst. And He's the one that you need to go and cry out to. Don't cry to your friend. Don't cry to your boyfriend or girlfriend. Cry to the one that knows how to handle the burden of your cares. And we are called to cast those cares upon Him. It's okay to cry out. The second thing we need to do is we need to appeal. We need to appeal. So the first thing is to cry The second thing is to appeal. It means to appeal to His nature, appeal to the just judge that's in heaven, appeal to the one who has the power to overrule the verdict over your life. Appeal to the one that is good. God is good regardless of the outcome. Bible says that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. And we are destroyed and filled with anxiety and fear because we don't know who our God is. You see, it says, be still and know that I am God. But if you don't have the knowledge of who He is, you can't appeal to His nature. You just take whatever is coming at you and you think God is behind it all. I cannot tell you how many young people, especially in this generation go, well, why did God allow that? And if God was loving, why didn't He? He stopped that. Guys, I just need you to know we live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. God's given us free will. People will do bad things to good people. But this is why God in all His goodness and kindness sent Jesus His Son so that He could redeem that which was lost and stolen by the enemy. Yes, God is in control, but guess what? We told Him to take His control and we took control into our hands He has been good since the beginning of time. And He's good regardless of your situation right now. He's good because He will turn it around. And so to appeal to God, which is what we can do, is to make an application to a higher court for a decision to be reversed. Those of you that maybe are studying law, if you are, you understand that you can make an appeal When a decision has been made in a court of law and you're not in agreement with it, you can make an appeal to the court to reverse the decision. If you've got the evidence, then you know that you can make an appeal. If you've been unjustly accused, if you have been falsely detained, you can make an appeal. And anything that is not of God, whether it be sickness, whether it be pain, whether it be affliction, that is from the enemy that does not come from God. So we can make an appeal to the nature of God as sons and daughters of God to reverse that decision over our life. You see, Job Chapter 16, verse 19 says, Even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high. He's appealing to a higher authority about what has been going on in his life. He's like, I need to appeal. My advocate is in heavenly places because right now what's come against me is not from God. And I need to appeal to my Father and I need to have Him change it. And guess what? He did. He changed it. So I want you to appeal to the nature of God. If you've been giving, you can appeal to the nature that says, uh, give and it is given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, falling into your lap. If you have sown kindness, you can say, God, whatever your Word says that whatever I sow, I reap. If you appeal God, Word. You say, in your Word, it says that if I forgive and I pray, then you will hear me. You can appeal to the nature of God that says that you're my Father, that you're my provider, that you're my healer. Start to use the Word of God and say, God, you said in your Word. When I was barren and I couldn't have children, I didn't just take what the doctor said about this. I appealed to the nature of God. What was the very first command He gave mankind? 
He said, be fruitful and multiply. So I said, God, I need to appeal to your nature. Your nature is that you commanded your people to be fruitful and multiply. You want me to be a mother. You commanded me to be a mother. Therefore, I'm gonna appeal to your nature. And right now my body is broken. It's it's in need of healing. And your Word also says that you're my healer. So God, I need to appeal. Overrule this verdict that I'm infertile. Overrule it. It is not sustained. It's overruled by you in the courts of heaven. So I'm gonna appeal to your nature. And I appealed and I appealed and I didn't just appeal once, I appealed again and again and again for a few years. And then God um, opened my womb and I have now two beautiful miracle children that one's about to finish high school and I give all glory to God because I appealed to His nature and I didn't take the verdict or the diagnosis that that may be a fact, but the truth of God's Word is that He is healer. So some of us need to get a little bit uh, um, bold in our prayers, if you like, to appeal to the nature of God. But some of us just take what's given and we're like, oh, woe is me, sorry about that. And God's saying, no, appeal to my nature in Jesus' Name. The third thing, so first is cry. The second is appeal. The third is remember. We need to remember what God did in the past so that we can be full of faith that He'll do it again. So whatever you're going through right now, you have to look at your situation, not as an isolated situation, but one that has got you growing from glory to glory. So now you need to look at the times in the past where God has come through for you. And you need to remember the miracles of the past. You see, Psalm 103 verse 2 says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Now listen to what His benefits are. Scripture is full of promises. So praise the Lord, first of all, O my soul. Some of you need to get your soul praising God even when you don't feel like it. And then you need to remind yourself of what He came to give us. So He says, forget not all His benefits. Let's look at the benefits. Who forgives all your sins, heals your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, satisfies you your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed." My goodness, this needs to build your faith. Remember, He saved you. He healed you. He delivered you. He put the crown of love on you. He satisfies your desires with good things. He renews your youth like the eagle. He works in your behalf, on your behalf, and He delivers the oppressed. And so if you feel oppressed, if you feel depressed, if you feel anxious, if you feel full of fear, understand that you can praise God right now and remember that He saved you. That's actually the greatest miracle that you'll ever encounter is salvation. And with that comes benefits. But do you know? Do you know the access that you have? So you need to remember, oh God, I remember when you provided that position for me, when it looked impossible. I remember when you healed my body. I remember when you provided financially for me. I remember where you made a way where there was no way. I remember what you did for my mom and my dad. I remember what you did for my sister and my brother. I remember what you did for my best friend. I remember what you did in my life. So God, if you did it then, you can do it again. But you know what I've realised is that we remember what we should forget and we forget what we should remember. We are spending all our time remembering what should be forgotten. Some of you still pay penance for the sin that you committed and you just can't forgive yourself. So you, you remember what God's already forgotten. As far as the East is from the West, so are my transgressions from me, like I don't, West never meets East. 
yet you're still going over and remembering instead of remembering what He did for you and saved you and forgave you. You remember the abuse that happened. You remember the upbringing that you had. You remember the negative effects of that divorce. You remember all the tragedy instead of going, God, I remember you being near to my broken heart. I remember you providing that mentor that came into my life. I I remember when at youth group, I had a friend who prayed the right prayer at the right time. I I remember when you, you healed my heart. I remember, so God, I know you can do it again and you've got to give thanks. I'm telling you, thankfulness and gratefulness precedes the miraculous. And so we need to remember because when you remember, you realise, oh God, if you did it then, you'll do it again. Because this is the most beautiful thing that in Philippians 4, when it says, um, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer, petition with thanksgiving, not petition with complaining. You don't petition God like you have to remind Him of what's going on in your life, like He doesn't know. Like, I think the church is really freaked out about this pandemic. Like, do you think God didn't know about the pandemic? So when we petition Him, we don't petition Him with complaint. We petition Him with thanksgiving first. Because when we thank Him first, that's why even the Lord's Prayer, we're honouring His position first. We're thanking Him. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Your Name. I'm praising Your Name. Oh, praise the Lord, O my soul. We're putting Him in His rightful place because when we do that, then our prayers are not so melancholy, but they shift from being like these tasks that we want Him to complete the list, but rather we're like, okay, God, do something in me. What am I supposed to learn in this? What am I supposed to do in this? And that's when the peace of God that transcends all understanding guards our heart, mind in Christ Jesus. And so we need to understand when we worry, we're fueling the enemy and we're giving him what he wants. He, he roams around like a lion. He's not the lion. The only lion that we know is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he roars like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the ones he devours are the ones that don't put these practices in place. The ones that wallow in self-pity, the ones that forget His benefits, the ones who get caught up in the drama and the chaos of circumstance instead of going straight to the Father and casting those cares. So you need to cry, you need to appeal, you need to remember, and then you need to enlarge. You need to enlarge God over your circumstances. I cannot tell you Uh, How many times in my own life I have enlarged the problem to be bigger than God? You know, I bring God down to my level. I look at the problem and I'm like, God, I don't know how you're going to get through this. I don't know how you're going to make a way. This is an impossible situation. And God's like, "Uh, with man, it's impossible. But with God, nothing's impossible. So we need to start enlarging God over the circumstances. We used to sing this song back in Australia. It was like, my God is big. He's so strong and mighty. My God, He's good. He's good to me. My God, He is big. He's the God of my refuge. He is the rock on which I stand. He is the fortress. He is over my life. He is the one that holds everything in His hands. So when you start enlarging God, you're like, you're bigger, you're better, you're grander than anything in the whole wide world. So now my my problem is diminished to the rightful place. But the enemy loves to exacerbate the problem like it's the biggest problem on earth and make it bigger than God. When what we're doing is actually idolising the problem instead of enlarging God over the problem. I love that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It says, look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. 
There's something in that. We don't just sing songs to make us all warm and fuzzy, but they're declarations and they're, they're, they're markers that cause us to look up Look up and see where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord. I look to the hills. I look up. I look, I'm not looking down. I'm looking up. And spiritually speaking, we need to learn how to look up. We've got to build God bigger than our situation. I remember a few years ago, I was at home and I was so broken about a situation that now when I look back in hindsight, it was petty and pathetic. But at the time, it was massive to me. And at the time, Louis Giglio had just brought out Indescribable and uh, someone had given me the DVD and I had kind of thrown it away like, yeah, I'll look at that when I have time. And I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me, go watch that video. And I'm like oh, I don't really feel like watching a video. I'm full of problems right now. I've got, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm burdened. But this thing would not stop nagging me. And so I popped on that DVD because I just was sick of the nag. You know, you feel that nagging. Don't ignore the nag because God's wanting you to do something in your life. So I pop on that DVD and if you've seen it, you realise that Louis talking about the grandeur and majesty of our God who put the planets and the galaxies and he was intentional and the, the, the vast scope of his majesty and the magnitude of these, these, these out of space things that actually then he brings it down to the most beautiful detail of us. And, and I'm literally prostrate on the floor weeping because I finally got it. It was like, God, you're the God of the heavens and the earth. You just declared, let there be light. You declared the moon and the stars be in the sky. You separated earth from the waters and the land. And this is the God that I serve. And I'm worried about a pathetic little thing. If you can put all the galaxies and you can orbit uh, earth and sun and moon and stars and galaxies and temperatures and seasons, like, are you kidding me? Here I am worried about this pathetic thing. Yet when I look up and I see the grandeur of who you are, I'm like, my goodness, what am I doing? And it immediately slapped me in the face going, wake up, Alex, do you realise God is so much bigger and he has, he has the answer for this? And so you enlarge God over your circumstances. And I'm telling you, your perspective changes. Your problem might not change, but your perspective changes from woe is me and how on earth and what is gonna happen to my God is big. My God is good. My God is strong. He is my fortress, my refuge, the rock in which I stand and I am gonna be okay because He's bigger and He's greater and my help comes from Him and Him alone and things begin to change. But this is how your prayer life needs to change. Your words affect your world that you live in. And the final thing as we close is to sing. You may go, what? To sing. The first is cry. The second is appeal. The third is remember. The fourth is enlarge. And the fifth is sing. Isaiah 54 verse one says, Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labour, because more are the children of the desolate woman than her who has a husband, says the Lord. Sing, pregnant woman? Nope. Sing, barren woman. Sing when you haven't seen the miracle. Sing when you are in the middle of the miracle. Sing when there isn't anything to sing about. Because what we are doing is we are making a declaration that I will sing regardless of the outcome. I will give praise and honour to God, not just when He comes through for me, but because of who He is. Sing, praise precedes breakthrough. Praise precedes the miracle. A sacrifice of praise is something that's incense to the nostrils of God because what it's saying is, oh, my daughter trusts me before the miracle. She's not just loving me when I give her the miracle. I find this generation is more in love with the miracle than the miracle worker. 
They're more in love with what He can do for me than just for who He is. But God is saying, when you learn to worship me, in spirit and in truth, when you learn to worship me, even before the breakthrough, I'm telling you what happens on the inside of you removes all fear, removes all anxiety. It's why Paul and Silas could be in prison, locked up in chains. And what do they choose to do? They choose to praise. And it's their praise that breaks the chains. It's their, chain, uh, it's their praise that breaks open prison doors. It's their praise that sees the God get saved. It's their praise that sees the prisoners and captives released. Your praise is not only for you, but it's for others. When my dad died, I sang. When I lost a baby, I sang. Was I full of happiness? No, but I sang knowing that You are good God, regardless of my circumstance, regardless of the outcome. Yet will I praise Thee, yet will I give You honour in my life because You are worthy of praise, whether it works for me or not. Because what I have learnt, guys, is that my salvation was a gift and He doesn't have to give me anything else because grace is enough. And when we learn to sing because we are saved, when we learn to sing because He is King, the miraculous flows out. So I know that when you give praise, even before the miracle, it is like worship to God. But when you complain and when you're full of fear and when you're full of complaining and anxiety, that's worship to the enemy. The enemy loves it when you're full of angst. The enemy loves it when you worship Him with your fear and anxiety. But let's flip the narrative and let's learn to cry out, cry that river. Let's learn to appeal to the nature of God. Let's learn to remember the miracles of the past. Let's learn to enlarge God over the problem. And let's learn to sing because that's when we stand on the truth that our God is in control and that I can be still and know that He is God. Every head bow, every eye closed. For those of you that are struggling with anxiety and fear right now, I want you to just put your hand on your heart. And I just want you to do this simple thing by saying, God, I come out of agreement with fear and anxiety. I repent for enlarging my problem over you. And God, I choose today to put you in your rightful place. And from this day forward, I'm gonna learn to cast my cares on you. I'm gonna learn to pray all these things that will shift my life into a place of faith instead of a place of fear and anxiety. And I know that I don't need to do the work because you've already done it, but I can trust that the God who is at work in my life will work on my behalf when I learn to be still and know that You are God. Remember who You are and do what has just been spoken and God, You will change our lives. God, I thank You for every student leaning in to listen to this Word. God, I pray that this Word produces much fruit and that there will be a shift in perspective and that there will be an outpouring of Your Spirit and others will look upon their lives and say, what is it about You that even though chaos and calamity are all around You, You are good. And that is gonna be our greatest witness. So we thank You, God, for every student that has lent in and responded to this Word. God, I pray You bless them, that You stay with them, that Your favour would be upon them. In Jesus' Name, Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for having me. I hope to be in person with you one of these days. Take care. God bless.